Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country. Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted, award-winning coffee at GotYourSixCoffee.com. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with D'Artagnan Crockett. D'Artagnan is a competitive judo athlete for the United States. Crockett is legally blind. He won the bronze medal in the men's 90 kilogram division at both the 2012 Summer Paralympics in London and the 2016 Summer Paralympics in Rio. D'Artagnan has lived a profound journey of resilience. I'm honored he is here now to share that journey with Get Up Nation. D'Artagnan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ben, for having me. I, it's an honor and privilege to be on the show and to and to speak with you. Uh, I'm, I'm so I'm so happy this worked out, and um, I just want to get right into it so people understand, uh, you know, the, how amazing you are and the things that you have uh, survived and gone through to, to achieve su- such success, such an impressive journey of resilience. Uh, will you share a little bit about your early life, born in inner city Cleveland? Uh, what yeah. was life like for you? So I grew up inner city Cleveland uh, with seven siblings mm-hmm. for the most part, and uh, at around age eight, I started to really start to kind of really want to develop. I started to develop a, a need or a tendency to be like my mom. So I started singing like her and wanted to be like her in that regard. But uh, like winter of 2000, not 2000, winter of 1999 is when my mother had died. Mm-hmm. And after she had died, I had, my family was sort of split up because there was, we had, there were seven of us, there were seven siblings. And then I went to live with my father because we had different fathers growing up. And in living with my father, it was at an early age, I realized that he battled with a substance abuse disorder. Mm. And over time, our house had kind of transitioned into a trap house. Mm. And if you or your viewers don't know what a trap house is, a trap house is a house within an inner city, typically, that sells drugs to addicts and dealers within the neighborhood. Mm. Um, and in finding and trying to find something to kind of keep me grounded in life. First, mm-hmm. my first thing that really gravitated toward was singing in a choir. And uh, it was singing in a choir in video games, actually. Mm-hmm. And singing in a choir was, it gave me, one, it gave me a place to share this gift of music, this gift of singing with, with others. And each of us on that choir, we each, we each had like something going on. Like, we each had something that we were struggling with or battling with that was just too much to really talk about or even handle. So when we showed up together in that choir room, none of that mattered. We were able to leave that outside and come to the choir and show up and show out with each other. And that was that was something that was incredibly beautiful, beautiful for me and some and an incredible outlet to have that I didn't realize was as profound for me until very recently as I started kind of doing a lot of research into my own trauma and doing a lot of understanding and figuring and building language around that and reconstructing and also revisiting narratives that I've had either in my life or certain traumas that I've mm. hadn't been able to sit and process or heal from. Sure. And, but in that, after a while, like there was a time where I was attacked and mugged and robbed. And that kind of showed me that, if I was going to survive in the world that I was currently in, I was going to have to adapt while singing and video games and kind of being a part of a choir gave me that, that stability gave me, it gave me some sort of peace. Like it wasn't enough to help me survive in my environment. And so after that, uh, after that incident, when I was attacked, I was, I decided immediately that it was time for me to learn how to fight and it's time to learn how to, how to start surviving 
And so by my senior year in high school, I became a four sport athlete and it was powerlifting, football and track and uh, wrestling. I was on a powerlifting team because I had to be the strongest. I was on a uh, track. I ran track and field and played football because I had to be the fastest and quickest if I wasn't the strongest. And I wrestled because if I wasn't either of those, I had to be the best. And so my athletic career for me actually turned it out into a sort of a point of survival for the environment that I was in. And, and while it showed me a lot and gave me so much, it, it, it gave me what it gave me to pursue that career was another outlet of healing that I didn't realize was as tremendous for me as it was until recently after the research that I've done was trauma. However, the fact remained that like I still hadn't dealt with it and I still hadn't processed it. So after, after my career, I retired about two years ago and now I'm like jumping into a full-time career as an educator and resilience and recovery coach as well as inspirational speaker while finishing a uh, sociology degree. Nice. Nice. That's, that's awesome. And so are you doing anything with music today? Are you, are you making music? Um, I'm not making music, but see right there, there's a uh, yeah. Genevieve, my saxophone. Nice. And, and in one of my, uh, my newer keynote that I put together, mm-hmm. uh, I actually sing toward the end of it. I sing oh. in it as sort of that last punchline because that is something that is a part, that's been such a huge part of my life. Wow. And it's something that like in my keynotes, I share, I share pieces of my story and I also share a sense of vulnerability. So in that sure. sharing something that like I, that was my life growing up and that was my purpose, that was my passion. I began putting that into my keynotes. Wow. That's excellent. Now, uh, along the way, as you dealt with uh, all of this trauma, you profound uh, you had a profound friendship. Uh, Leroy Sutton. He also yeah. he was a double amputee um, from an incident on a train track, and he's your best friend. I would assume that um, you're still best friends today. You guys have a unique bond. Will you talk about how uh, that relationship was also some uh, something that gave you strength and the ability to be resilient with your connection with Leroy? Absolutely. Uh, our, our connection really spawned from the fact that we were both these two inner city black kids who have had a tremendously difficult hand thrown at them. And in light of that, despite that, we both still remain compassionate and kind toward others. And we still, still extended that outwardly, unconditionally. And we both mirrored that quality, and that's what really kind of created our bond, was that immense level of kindness, despite all of the darkness that was kind of surrounding both of us. And, and that's what initially attracted Lisa Finn, the ESPN producer, to our story. Initially, it was going to be a story of our wrestling and athletic careers, but as the cameras kept rolling, they started to see the very unique bond that we had which was built on love and compassion despite chaos around us and and having that sort of lightness that that's still sort of fun spirited energy just in your life even even when you're just going through the thick of it can can be what helps you move through it. it it's not the end all be all but it definitely it definitely helps and during these experiences with, with Lisa and, and with Leroy, you set your um, sights on, the, on judo and the Paralympics, and you uh, mm-hmm. uh, began to train in 2009, and you moved to Colorado in 2010. Will you take us through that transition as, as you, know, you were thinking of what you wanted to do with your life and how you mm-hmm. uh, wanted to have these outlets? You'd, sustain, you'd been through so much trauma throughout that, then you're and, and you found an outlet in this sport. Tell me how that transition went for you as you moved to Colorado. Um, it was pretty rocky at first. I think that uh, while wrestling what gave me so much and was as great as it was, it really helped me kind of survive in sort of a rougher area. And judo kind of helped sort of tame that in a way. And to where it helped me kind of approach situations more cool headed because we practice that, that very real martial art piece of judo. Mm -hmm. And so 
there was there's definitely something to be said about my transition with that from a wrestler to being a judo athlete. Mm -hmm. But uh, transitioning out there in general was very tough because I'd known nothing of the sport of judo before moving out there in 2010. Well, a little bit. I had trained at a dojo, but not for very long. Not, not long enough to be just moving on out to the Olympic Training Center and whatnot. But my coach, <laughs> my coach Ed Liddy, saw something special. He saw past what, what he had seen on the outside and saw, he saw my potential. Yeah. And so he gave me an opportunity to come live at the Olympic Training Center and come train for the games. And and with that opportunity, knowing that like this was this was my means to an end, not only was it that, but it also became something I did fall in love with because I knew that a after a while, it, it was clear that judo was building a foundation that I didn't already have yet. It was helping me build a foundation of skills, behaviors, and coping mechanisms that were helping me navigate through life in a more conscious and mindful way that I hadn't before. Because there were so many different things I had to learn along that process of becoming an athlete that I didn't need, I either didn't learn in a home growing up because my family didn't have those tools or resources, or I didn't learn in school because it, they're just things that aren't school, like financial stability, uh, budgeting a checkbook, um, building a grocery shopping list, um, uh, just, different other aspects of self-sufficient, like booking a plane flight, traveling, um, just what it's like to kind of like really live on your own. I learned all those things as an athlete and other skills like social networking, self-advocacy and stuff like that. And I think the only, not the only thing, the, uh, the biggest takeaway from my career is that it really helped me jump into a different identity that wasn't my own yeah. before moving out there. As I said, like, then, as you know, like there, I, I carry a tremendous amount of trauma and this is why judo was so helpful because the trauma that I carried, it, I'd lived out that same narrative of mine, the same trauma in my life. I was living it out and it kept manifesting itself in my life and in, in behaviors or coping mechanisms that no longer served me. Mm -hmm. And in diving fully into judo, I was able to rewrite new narratives mm -hmm. that included D'Artagnan that was D'Artagnan and, and have that be filled with something that was of my own design rather than living through life still with trauma. So I was able to assume a different identity, identity and create a new narrative within that. The only thing with that was after I retired, because I hadn't necessarily dealt with any of this stuff before, retirement became very difficult because retirement for an athlete is, right. is difficult in and of itself. Just taking yourself out of your sport and coming back into normality, to normality, but then retiring with, with an immense amount of trauma and no real understanding or language of how to navigate that. And, and I think the biggest thing my career has taught me was how to be resourceful, was how to swim through the suck of it. Because there had been times in my career where everything just sucked. Like 2015 was nothing went right my way. I didn't make a podium. I didn't win any tournament. I didn't do well at any tournament. And it was, it was just a bad year for me emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. Like I didn't, I almost quit before like, before my second Paralympic debut and not debut, but before my second Paralympic appearance. And, and what I learned in that is that as, as terrible as times can be, as, as long as crappy seasons can be, there is a way to move through it by making yourself as comfortable as possible. You can't solve all of your issues, but increment, it, it taught me incremental goal setting and, and just living with being uncomfortable sometimes and just allowing everything to come up and be there as you're moving through it. Cause that's sometimes the only way to get through it mm -hmm. instead of just getting over and getting past it, which right. is oftentimes the, the mindset mm -hmm. judo and that career has taught me how to move through certain negative situations while working with them and while learning and growing 
with the weight of it. And so that when I, when I and when then I ever, when I inevitably come across that again, because I will, just like everyone else will at some point come across something else that's challenging or just overwhelming and it's too much. Like I'll, I found myself to have been better adapt at navigating within that chaos and navigating when internally everything is turbulent and externally everything is turbulent. Turbulent. You are clearly brilliant. You are clearly um, highly emotionally intelligent. You you understand. Um, you have a ton of self awareness as you as you process everything that's happened to you. And to to watch these videos that that show you competing, it's so impressive because it's not just a, a judo match. It is a, a young man grappling with some of the worst adversity any human being can face. And to see that's why you are so inspiring is because you 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 continue to learn and grow through all of it. And it's not just a match. It's not just a a momentary competition. It's you growing into the brilliant future that you have now and that you have ahead of you still and will have ahead of you, uh, you know, for as long as you breathe. And so you, and to see you with the, with Leroy, you guys providing each other um, such uh, camaraderie, and uh, inspiration and support through this process. I'm sure that you know there are others and other situations that have that have also supported you through this. But I just think of how powerful that was in 2012 when you're dealing with all of this, when you're navigating all of this trauma, when you're you're ascending the ranks. You go, you'd only been training for less than three years, and you're already, you know, you're you're winning a bronze. Take us through that. I mean, you're in that. You won your first match in 2012. You took a loss from Samuel Ingram from Great Britain, and then you had to win two matches to get a medal. And what – I mean, and you – and then Leroy is there. Uh, mm-hmm. They made it possible for Leroy to be there, and then you hear him cheering you on from the sidelines. You see this – you, you know that this reality is you have two matches to win. You go on to win it. You win the bronze, and then you go on to have more success. But I, I just love how – you know, you are taking this to a whole deeper level. You're taking this toward, um, you're helping people who may aspire to success in sports. Uh, you're taking it way beyond that to, to show people what true success is. And that's a level of self-awareness. It's a level of respect for others. It's a level of, you know, revering um, life in a way where the challenges come, but we, we continually uh, navigate those. We build each other up. We keep going forward with a positive viewpoint, even when we have, when even when we take a loss, even when we are a quote failure for five seconds, you know, before we continue to move forward and learn and grow and build, you are a profound inspiration for h- how many. And so now as you speak to, to crowds, as you speak to young people, as you speak uh, to this nation where there's so much, um, you know, pain that is surfacing where, 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 where everybody has not been given a fair shot, where you have, you have come up in the inner city and, and are a, a, an example of character and integrity and compassion and positivity, truly one of our nation's um, you know, brightest spirits that's out there. How is it for you to, to see what's happening with, with who you are, with what our nation needs, and to be able to provide this with your words and experiences? How satisfying is that? I think that um, for a while I didn't know what my purpose was or what what my calling was or what I even really wanted to do. However, last year, once last year, I kind of hit a breaking point. I kind of hit a point where every step, every morning, just felt too overwhelming. Everything was just way too difficult. I was working full time. I was in school full time. Wow. I was missing judo. I wasn't clear on what my purpose was or what what was wrong with me what was or what's happened to me to to put me in that state to where i was just kind of hanging and leaning on old coping mechanisms that were either no longer serving me or or bringing my own trauma into my relationship and coloring that in a very negative way and and upon hitting that i realized that as as angry as i was for so long and in some ways i still am as to what's happened to me, sure. I, I, I realized that like I as I'm, I'm not responsible for any of it. 
and no one is. No one's responsible for their pain or for their trauma. But I was responsible for my healing because no one else was going to take care of that piece for me. And so I went to jumping all in and, and something that I love doing, something that, that I think is, is what got me to where I am is I'm very good at generalizing information and bringing in information from multiple different careers and creating synergy from that or some sort of synthesis. And while coupling my career as an athlete and as a speaker, as an envoy, coach and educator, I'm finding that trauma shows up in all of those aspects, especially in regards to teaching some of that. And, and in the ways in which I teach and I speak about trauma is, is based in narrative. I, I can, I, I know the science is behind it and I do talk on some of it, but what I've really taken, taken away from trauma and what is sort of my niche and in my wheelhouse is creating narrative, adjusting narrative, re, reshaping narrative for the greater good. And that, that is very contingent on trauma. And even, even if you're just looking at trauma through a general lens and with the understanding that not everyone carries trauma, but there's still something to be said about the narrative that we hold or the stories that we assign to particular symbols in our lives, which is, is something that can be defined by symbolic interactionism, which is a, a sociological term. And with those stories, we react and behave in regards to that story that we have in our head. So if we have a great story, of course, we're going to see the symbol, whatever, whether it's an institution of education, finances, law enforcement, mm -hmm. school, whatever it is, we'll, we'll see that in a positive light if we've always had positive experiences with it. Right. However, if we have trauma that's wrapped up in that, we're going to react to that in adversely. Right. We won't react the same way because that it's been imprinted on us. And, and I didn't realize how how important that work was going to be for this moment, for where we are, nor was I prepared for how low it was going to bring me, nor how high it was going to bring me. Wow. And just the, just the amazing insight that I've gotten from, from pursuing whatever avenue I can, from talk therapy to mm -hmm. my own research. I'm, uh, I'm planning on pursuing more in-depth trauma therapy for myself as, as I'm in a place to have access to that. Um, and yeah, I think that just having increased my understanding, increased my knowledge on it, also like looking toward a spiritual sense of sort of Eastern healing of working with energies, working with chakras and different sort of other spiritual methods for healing and just introducing pieces of it, even if I don't take the whole thing in my life and still incorporating that in my day to day. Sure. Do you have a meditation practice? I do. Yeah. Um, it's not a perfect one and I don't meditate every single day, but mm -hmm. whenever, whenever I, I find that like I, I can get the, that 10 minutes in at the very least 10 to five to 10 minutes, I try and meditate and that can be at any point in the day. If I just have the time, whether it's in the morning after lunch, even if it's sort of a walking meditation, I'll just kind of, leave, I'll leave my phone at home and just be in that walk and be in that moment and just really focus on breathing and just energy transfer between myself and just the rest of the world. And just, yeah. And, and while like I haven't like really incorporated yoga, it, it still is, it's, it's been, it's been incredibly, incredibly wonderful for me too to just have something that, yeah, that does, that is meditation that helps with that mindfulness piece in helping me recenter and reground after or before a long strenuous day. Right, right. How can we, I guess, how are you working to, and how, how can we as a country, how can we, Take the pain of so many people who have been slighted and ignored and harmed and abused 
And how can we, in, in practical ways, ease the suffering of, of people in our community that have been, that have been allowed to suffer without, without intervention, without mm-hmm. somebody who, hearing their voice? How can we as a nation respond effectively to people who have grown up with such trauma, who have been abandoned largely by greater society? How can we be effective in valuing uh, people who have been through so much? I'd say first and foremost, in valuing people who is, who carry an immense amount of trauma is validation. Yeah. It's validation that their pain is real, that their trauma is real, and that they're worthy of healing. And that while it wasn't their fault, there is still a solution. Just validation and allowing that person to show up with their pain, with their trauma, with their hurt, and exist without apologizing for it, without being shamed for it. And and then being coached or taught or guided on how to begin healing from that. And, and, I, like, and, and as that, and that has to be changed, I think, with society's narrative. Yeah. Because I find that when we, when people invalidate someone else's experiences, it's because it's not their lived experience. And it's also because they're hanging on to a narrative that they held over or of a particular situation or a particular system. For example, easy thing right now, police system and Americans who are very patriotic, white nationalist, supremacists, or very, very American and very pro-police and everyone else. That narrative of the police force is to protect and serve and guide and help individuals while that may be a part of their narrative and part of their reality. It's only a piece of the full reality. And they're unable to let go of, of their own narrative, their own experiences with that. And, aren't, and they aren't able to hold on to the duality that while this means peace, justice, equality, and all these great things for you, this means something vastly different for a different sec- a group of people. Right. And that understanding and that acknowledgement and, and that work to educating yourself on looking between the lines and looking for where is institutionalized racism, going to a bar or going to a library or into a coffee shop and look around for black people. Yeah. And when you do that, look around for, start, start looking around for people looking at black people. You're going to find it. And and I think that oftentimes people think that when we're talking about racism and, and bigotry in this country now, we're, we, we think of the KKK or like extreme white nationalists in that sort of violent era. While that's still a threat and that's still very real, what's becoming more prevalent are the, are the invisible threats. Right. The, the smiling when you see me, but we'll call the police when you see a brown person in the neighborhood. Right. The... The I have at least one black friend, so I'm not racist. <laughs> like those are the those are the real threats. And like even what I see now, like it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened very recently, but it, it's it's still happened in my lifetime within within the past year. But I've had people cross the street when they see me mm-hmm. to get to the other side, and that's again because of a narrative that that people hold in the U.S. of of the black man. And I think that reshaping narratives where reshaping the narrative that we hold, mm-hmm. that is that that's that internal narrative that this is my experience with this institution, this is my experience with this symbol. Mm-hmm. And accepting like yes, yes, this is my experience, as good as it may be, there's another side to it, that it can be negative, that it has hurt people, that it has caused a lot of trauma, distress and all these other negative things and it can live in this reality mm. having been a part of both of that it just needs to be mended now it can't continue to be ignored and then written off as it's not that bad or we've come so far when we haven't come that far we've just devolved into something different mm-hmm. and that's in as you spoke that i just thought of you know what if so a person crosses the street what if that person had seen the amazing like 
if, what if that person could have been stopped in that moment and just shown the video of what you've lived through, of who you are today, or heard this beforehand, and how we could just shake each other out of these narratives, these false narratives in our heads by actually stopping, paying attention to each other, listening to each other, hearing what narratives are being, being uh, you know, articulated and challenging, and challenging false ones and, and, and recognizing that what we have in our head may, may be completely untrue mm -hmm. and, and facilitating situations where we can have dialogues, where the glory of each person can be seen, where what they've experienced can be articulated, like you said, like you, you described there, of validating them, of saying your pain matters, of saying mm -hmm. your, it, it's important and I want to hear it, even if it makes me uncomfortable, even if I change or, or should change or must change after it, mm -hmm. um, how can the narrative in my mind be more accurate to the world out there? And I love that, that thought of mindfulness and in my practice of how that's been so... Uh, fruitful for me and enriching for me to really see how, you know, the fight or flight mind quickly is focused on fight or flight of, of threats mm -hmm. that are out there instead of truly being able to see the actual picture in the moment. The only real moment is now. And how can we as people interact when largely we hide behind our electronics or, or are way too busy? How can we hide have a two party system? We hide behind different, different titles. We hide behind different, yep socioeconomic statuses or categories. There's a lot of things that our society hides behind to remain in many ways isolated. Yeah, right, right. Uh, tell me, from your perspective, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? The hardest thing I've ever done was allowing myself to live and accept myself with my trauma and moving through that and finding some healing in that. That has to be the most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah. Um, and this is because it's, and, and it's, it's part of the reason why I wanted to, uh, why I want to go into the work that I've done, because it made me realize that I didn't just all of a sudden pull myself up by the bootstraps and become successful or become hard determined or like strong willed. This it, it was over time and with a lot of people investing in me and like finding outlet and healing in a lot of ways. And there have been times where I'd fall into an emotional flashback from from some of my trauma and and I'd and I'd be in it and just be screaming of how do how did I even get through this as a kid? How did I even manage this pain as a young child, let alone as an adult that's still like where mental health is, isn't really accessible. There isn't a lot of ways, but like the care that and the treatment that I would need isn't accessible to me just yet. I'm working on it, but, <laughs> yeah. and I think that, yeah, dealing with my own trauma and moving and healing through that has been the most difficult thing for me. I always end, um, I always end the show with six quick questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. I know your time here, you, you're, we're coming close to the time that, uh, and I want to respect uh, your other commitments here. Uh, just wondering if you'd run through these six quick questions with me. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Who are you thankful for today? I am thankful for my partner, Holly Shomer. And now She's been a guiding light for me and has held me with an, an, an immeasurable amount of grace through my, uh, through my grieving and healing process. And now that we've covered who you're thankful for today, what are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for the abundance that I'm, uh, that I'm beginning to see in my life after, after moving through what I've been through, after putting in the work, after, after being as low as I possibly could be. <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm grateful for the abundance. How do you fuel the fire within you? Ooh, I feel it with connection. I feel it with knowledge. I feel it with, with self-love, self-care, and, and dog walks. <laughs> <laughs> 
What is one thing adversity taught you to value? One thing adversity taught me to value is adversity. It taught me to value the journey and to accept every step back as well as all those many steps forward that you're going to take along the way. And that as, as challenging as a season might be, accepting that as a part of the journey, as part of you witnessing your life's legend, as, as it's talked about in the book, The Alchemist, which is an amazing book, by the way, it, it becomes manageable because it's not something that I just have to get past, I have to get past, I have to get over. And you're beating yourself over the head with like all these terrible ideas on how you're just going to get successful quick, whatever that may look like to you. You'll just be a part of the journey. And on your bad days, they'll just be bad days and you'll move through it and learn how to cope and, and make better decisions that's going to make you comfortable through those bad days. And on those great days, you're going to learn how to maintain that momentum, maintain that humility and that structure that you're going to need in order to maintain that the abundance that will come in your life once you start uh, accepting adversity as a part of the journey and moving through that with the intention to evolve with that and to grow with it. So you can carry the weight of it. What are you doing today? You may have never thought you could. I'm leading. I'm inspiring. I am being seen. And what will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? I will continue to lead. I will step into a new role as an educator, which is something I never thought I'd do because I, I carry so much trauma within the education system. And most of my life, I wanted to stay as far away from education as I possibly could. Starting a new job as a program lead for an elementary school helped me to begin to heal a ton of that trauma by being being the teacher that I wasn't afforded growing up. Like I had so many teachers that modeled that for me, but that was oftentimes covered by the many teachers that didn't model that. And being able to be that helped me run, remember, remember the teachers that did model that. And it also helped me, yeah, it helped me find comfort in being able to to be that working force of light and warmth in a system that's broken, in a system that's damaged, and still have the ability and the desire to work within that system, knowing how damaged it is. Wow. D'Artagnan, how can people learn more about you and your amazing work? Um, I am on LinkedIn. I am on Instagram. Uh, I am currently working on a website. That'll be up soon. And yeah, those are the two places I, I post everything that I'm doing through that dog walks, uh, whatever, whatever I'm doing over that weekend, hiking, mountain biking, and all my professional speaking and, and workshops and in all my other endeavors I posted there.